So, talk about things I love. Talking about things I love. I was listening to an episode of Freakonomics. I'm sure some of you guys know what Freakonomics is. It's a really cool podcast. They do really cool episodes. And they had an episode of Freakonomics that was hosted by a guy who does, I think it's called Strategy or something. I forgot his actual name. But there was a guy who does this podcast. I think his name is PJ Volt. Freakonomics did a really good episode with this guy called PJ Volt. And he essentially did this podcast where he kind of talked about Berghain and how cool it was and the things that he checked out while going to Berghain. I think a couple of his friends actually um, went there and they obviously had a good time. Um, no, sorry, went there, but they didn't get in. And he basically spoke about, you know, the Laura Berghain and kind of gave a background on it and all of that malarkey. And it was really, 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 really good. So I really recommend that you guys will check that out. So this is the one I think on here, I'm gonna show you on the screen. So it's an episode of Freakonomics, this episode here. It's called Fascinatingly Mundane Secrets of the World's Most Exclusive Nightclub. It's from the 17th of the 6th. And the blurb says, the Berlin dance maker Berghain is known for its eight hour lines, inscrutable door policy. PJ Vault, host of podcast Search Engine, joins us to crack the code. It has to do with the Cold War rivalries, German tax law, and one very talented bouncer. So it's a really cool episode. Essentially what he's done, he's got his own podcast here called Search Engine. He's hosted one part under Freakonomics and the second part is under his own podcast called Free Search Engine. I recommend you check it out. The first um, episode that he did um, touched upon these two guys that he knows who tried to go into Berghain. They traveled from the States actually. Wild story. They traveled from America, right? They traveled from fucking America all the way to Berlin to try and get into Berghain. So I can't complain when I'm in the queue for fucking eight hours. These guys traveled eight hours, waited more than eight hours to try and get in and didn't get in in the end. But essentially that kind of is what is the jump off point for him to kind of research Berghain and find out all this shit about it. Really fascinating episode. Some things I want to point out that are really incredible about the episode. Number one thing he pointed out that I didn't realize I've known about it, but he drummed it home very succinctly and very clearly in the pod. He mentioned that the techno tourism, techno tourism accounts for 1.5 billion euros of Berlin city's GDP every single year. German's GDP, Germany as a country is 4 trillion. But Berlin itself and the nightlife industry contributes 1.5 billion. Can you imagine? That's insane numbers. Insane numbers. But it also explains why they probably are where they are. Why it's a bit of a, you know, it's kind of on its own as a city in terms of nightlife. No other place can kind of compare but the amount of money they generate kind of makes you see that they're seen even though you know there's a lot of locals there that go it is kind of being funded and really kept at that sort of level by tourism without it maybe it wouldn't hit those numbers it probably still would be quite high because people there live and breathe nightlife they live and breathe techno live and breathe clubs but 1.5 billion is wild wild for one city to generate just from nightlife alone because I think London's one, last time I checked, was like in the 700 millions or something of that nightlife. But that also included restaurants and shit. But this is tech, specifically techno tourism, 1.5 billion. I thought that was crazy. The second thing I thought that was really interesting was his um, description of Sven. So Sven Markard um, is one of the most famous bouncers in the world. And obviously one of the head bouncers, obviously there at Berlin, in Berghain specifically. And somebody that a lot of people are kind of scared of, intimidated by, blah, 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 blah. And I think he mentioned quite often in the episode that he's really tall, really tall, really tall. And he's not. <laughs> he's actually not that tall. But maybe I think when you're scared and you're nervous and you're really looking forward to being somewhere, maybe your sense of... Your, your perception is all warped. So maybe everything seems more grander. Even the spaces you're going to, the people you're seeing, they all seem larger than life. But he's actually not that tall. He's like five foot eight, five foot 10, maybe that, maybe that. But the guy in the podcast tried to make it sound like he was like six, five or something. Like he was a man mountain. But obviously he looks very intimidating and shit. But oddly enough, he's actually one of the nicer bouncers there. That's a funny thing. Of all the bouncers they have at Ber Berghain, I'm not sure if it's on purpose, Sven's actually the nicer one. He's actually the one that's gonna, I wouldn't say he's gonna talk to you like he's your friend, 
but he's not going to be he's not going to be as curt he's not going to be as cold he's not going to be as standoffish he is quite you know welcoming in that respect so that's always thought it was interesting that he looks the way he does he's covered in piercings and his face he's covered in face tattoos but actually in real life he's actually pretty sweet and a pretty cool guy the other thing i think is really impressive about sven listen to the episode he's a photographer he's been a professional photographer for most of his life um it's something that he takes very seriously and for the most part whenever he's being interviewed for an exhibition and shit he does tolerate questions about Bergheim, but he likes to concentrate most of his, um, you know, media press run and shit when he's promoting his gallery shows and maybe books and stuff to the photography work that he does. And I think that's very really admirable because I think other people in his position who were associated and work for one of the most famous nightclubs in the world would basically use that clout and kind of you know be into the ground they'd be talking about Bergheim consistently like how i do right i'm the loser that talks about it all the time i'm not even involved but he hardly talks about it unless asked and when he is asked about it he usually talks in very vague generalities about it he doesn't really like to go into detail about how to get in about what to wear about whatever the background he just likes to talk about his work as a photographer for the most part and might give you some blanket statements about how to get in and what not to get in but it's never anything that deep so he goes out of his way to only focus on his photography but i also think it's really cool that even though he's a big dj even so even though he's a big personality in the club scene he's never once i think from what i can remember gave him the impression that he wants to be a DJ. Everyone wants to be one, myself included. Everyone wants to be involved. Everyone wants to be playing in these clubs. Everyone wants to be in these green rooms, in these in these dinners, at these hotels, at these festivals and shit. But he, even though he's involved and has been a part of the, you know, the, the making history of one of the best clubs in the world and in a city that is, you know, widely regarded as like the kind of the mecca of fucking um, techno, especially in clubs and shit, He's made no assertions, no aspersions. He's casted no aspersions. He's made no inclinations that he wants to be a DJ himself. He's just focusing on his photography. He works there as a bouncer. He takes his job very seriously. They've got a great team of people there. He probably trusts and stuff that he's worked with for a long time. They know what they're looking for. They can make a judgment in a couple of seconds and shit. They usually are right on the money. Once you go in, you realize all of the faffy, annoying, pretentious, obnoxious, downright you know, discriminatory things they do at the door is to a reason. It's to, you know, it has a reason because once you go in there, the vibes are immaculate. But he doesn't try to be that guy on the front. He doesn't try to be the big star. He's almost like, will. he's almost like a really good number two or number three, which is also something that you don't really see a lot of these days. Everyone wants to be the big guy. It's even like we're still with parties, you know, un you know, unashamed people putting themselves on like the main lineup of a rave that they organize themselves so they can play. I think it's really cool. I think it's really, 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 really cool to see. But there's an interesting clip that I want to play here, courtesy of this particular podcast. I thought it was fascinating. And that clip is concerning the curfew because I'd never thought about it until they mentioned it in the pod. So he mentions how Berlin, how Berlin, Bergen, how Bergen, how Berlin came about to be a city that has no curfew because I never, I never even thought about it. But that's a big part as to why the scene is where it's at or the scene is at level it's at the quality it's at and why everyone wants to go and rave there because essentially you can be out if you want to you could be out from thursday to monday without a stop sometimes from tuesday to monday without a stop and um, bergen itself as a club is open from saturday all the way until monday without a stop in the in the haiti days sometimes it'll open until tuesday so all of that i think is what makes it a special place right but the history behind why it has why it was a 24 why it is a 24 hour city will actually fascinate you and is somewhat in line to what super jello is saying in the stream chat it's not all the way there but super jello is in the right line of thinking of how it became a 24 city it blew my mind because i didn't know this at all i was not aware of this being a fact but this is a really interesting tidbit of how berlin became a 24 hour city with no curfew I wanted Lutz to tell me how Berlin's unusual nightlife scene had come to be. And that story is the story of two arguments. The first argument takes place in the late 1940s. Argument one is about a very specific rule, curfew. In Berlin today, there is no curfew. Bars and clubs stay open as long as they want. And can you tell me the story of like how Berlin came to be a city with no curfew? Like, What is the origin story of that decision? 
The decision is like almost 80 years old and it happened right after World War II. So 1949, you had already a divided city between the Eastern sector and the Western sector. The Eastern sector controlled by the Russians and the Western sector controlled by the British, the French and the Americans. And in the Eastern part, there was a curfew at 10 p.m. So all the restaurants, bars, hotel bars, cabaret bars, etc., they had to close at uh, 10 p.m. in the eastern part. In the western part, it was 9 p.m., so an hour earlier. And there was this, let's say, representative of the hotels and restaurants of Berlin. His name was Heinz Zellermeyer. Heinz Zellermeyer. There was no club commission back then. Heinz was instead the deputy director of the Guild of Berlin Hoteliers. In photos, Heinz has an enormous smile and combed back hair. He looks like someone who held forth at a restaurant or two. Heinz did not like the curfew. He particularly did not like that his side of the city had an earlier curfew. The person to complain to was General Howley of the U.S. Army, the American's West Berlin Commandant. A meeting was set, and Heinz, supposedly, came prepared. The story is that he brought a bottle of whiskey to that meeting. So they met... And they were talking about it, and General Howley said, yeah, the British and the French, they are not really supporting any idea of losing this curfew. They say it's a security issue. So you have to give me an argument that I can give the French and the British. And the problem was that at that moment, in the Western part, people had to go out of the bar, and then they went to the Eastern sector for another hour, which was also not really liked by the Americans. So he said, if you kick Germans who are partying at a certain hour, you kick them out of the street, you're going to have a security issue. So you have to better find a solution for it. It was a well-reasoned argument. The Allies did not want drunk Westerners crossing east in search of a later last call. And worse, there had been an emerging Cold War of curfews, with each side, the East and the West, repeatedly extending an hour past each other to try to capture all the income from drunk Berliners. Eliminating curfew would solve the security issue and win the night war. General Howley was sold. He said, okay, let's try this out for two weeks. And since then, 1949, we have no curfew. Berlin, one of the rare cities that has no curfew at all. In 1949, when the city permanently deleted its curfew, obviously techno music did not exist. Raving was something people did in insane asylums. If anyone was listening to music in a club late at night, it was probably jazz. But this decision set Berlin on a path. Nightlife is funded more than anything else via the sale of alcohol. A city without a curfew can have a legal party that runs through the night, even that runs multiple nights. Half a century-ish later, techno will hit Berlin. People will begin to throw raves in illegal spots without permits. This will happen in a lot of cities at the same time. Detroit, New York, London. But what makes Berlin different from those places is that here... Many of those raves can actually become legitimate businesses, can find permanent homes and clubs. And that is the main reason why that city cannot be replicated. And I say this a lot, and I'm mostly saying it to myself, but I remember one of the first things that used to bum me out about leaving Berlin and coming back to London wasn't that I was leaving Berlin because I never want to live there. It's a bit of a crazy place to live, to be completely honest. I do prefer to kind of dibble and dabble and visit and come back home. But one of the things that used to bum me out was just a realisation that our club scene was shit compared to theirs. But if you think about it, the reason why theirs is the way it is, is because of their, avail- is their ability to not have a flipping curfew. That ability to be open for numerous days in a row, the ability from most clubs, even a, a normal standard cocktail bar in Alexander Platz is open until 4 to 6 a.m. in the morning. That slows down people's tendencies to go crazy with the drinking and the drugs. In, even though people still do go crazy and they overindulge, that allows people to take their time. So there's more of a culture of literally going to clubs sometimes at like one in the morning, four in the morning, because it's going to close at 6 p.m. the next day and stuff. But it just kind of changes the flow and the tempo of the rave. And it creates a different culture around it. Because what I'm used to in London, or what I'm used to in the UK, is people mostly going out 
to maybe see a big DJ, but also going out as an excuse to drink and to do drugs and to do it to an extreme and to do it very quickly because there's such a short window of time for you to do your stuff. Think about a regular town, maybe think about London. Think about a town outside of London. Um, most of their bars are gonna close before 12, if not 1 a.m. They might have one club in the area that's open until two. But the pubs and the bars, because they want punters to come in and drink there early, they might have special t you know, drink promotions that say, hey, if you're in the club, if you're in this bar and pub before 7 p.m., before 8 p.m., before 9 p.m., we're going to give you buy one, get one free. So you get all these people coming in to get buy one, get free drinks to the pub before 9. Then 9 comes around, they don't give you buy one, get one free anymore. Everyone leaves and tries to go to the club. By the time you go to the club, you're steaming. And you're not probably in the right mood to be a good raver or to enjoy the experience anyway. And then you're just chasing a high that you can't actually catch. And you end up discombobulated. You, you get chucked out of the club at 2 a.m. And now you're throwing up into the gutter somewhere and you've lost your wallet and your phone and maybe your keys. That happens so often around every part of the UK. But I think that would be alleviated, even though the UK and British people and English people, myself included, even though we're very susceptible to self-sabotage even though we're liabilities with a capital l i think our drinking culture and our club culture and our drug culture could be improved tenfold if most places were open later that would legitimately ease some of the pressure even you go to places in liverpool street you see so many people packed into clubs into cocktail bars super early because the drinks deals are really early and they're gonna close early so you need to get in it early to get your drinks in and then by the time they leave those places they're so drunk it's crazy whereas in berlin even though everywhere there people are selling drugs and doing drugs and drinking a lot i don't think i've seen a single fight anytime i've been out there not a single one none even if you go to a place like mitter and you go to all the commercial clubs with the commercial looking people and shit I've not seen one fight, one. So that must be because of this, you know, non curfew thing. But the way it happened is hilarious. The year it happened in, 1949, is hilarious. A lot of interesting things happened around that time. <laughs> the war itself was very interesting. So maybe there are some, uh, you know, there are some lessons to be learned there, right? Maybe there are some good ideas there. <laughs> you never know but one point i thought that was really interesting in the pod this is the last point in this particular podcast that i thought that was really interesting this one talking about bergheim this last point that they made was really interesting because it made me think should i be a participant or should i be happy to be a visitor because this guy was talking on a pod the the host of it pj vault um, basically made this particular podcast about Bergheim because his friends were traveling through the States to go there. But unfortunately, they didn't get in. And it was actually a fascinating story about how they went, their mood and shit. I actually prefer the stories of people, how they didn't get in and what their mindset was, blah, 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 and what they did after the fact, as opposed to the people that did get in. Because sometimes people that did get in, they almost feel like, they almost feel chosen and they almost have a really inflated sense of self and they get all up their own asses. It's a bit nauseating. The people that don't get in are usually pretty, you know, can give you a pretty um rational, nuanced point of view as to why they didn't get in, in their own opinion. Anyway, long story short, um, he speaks to a guy that's involved in the Berlin Club Commission and asks him, hey, what do you think about my friends? Here's a picture. What do you think? Um, would you have let them in if you were a Bergheim bouncer? And of course, the guy is like, typical berliner typical german person overly fucking um you know overly lit overly he took the point overly literally oh I'm, i don't work in clubs i don't know it's like bro just use your imagination all right so he finally gets through to him he uses his imagination and he speaks about how you know he doesn't think those guys would have got in and they didn't get in in the end but then he also offers a different way of how to get into those clubs and he basically um encourages people to be more participatory in the club scene so if you want to get into Bergheim, don't do what I do and just queue up like a regular punter. Try and get involved in the scene. And then that way, you might be able to get on a guest list that might make it easy for you to get in and stuff. So it's a very interesting perspective about how to navigate the club scene, which I don't personally agree with. But nonetheless, let's see what he has to say. I did at another place called Schwitz. I wondered what Chris and Dan would make of that judgment. So later I asked. Chris told me, Schwitz? They loved Schwitz. It was the club they'd ended up at after being rejected from Berghain. Berlin, this magical city, had somehow sent them to the place where they really belonged. Lutz was not a selector, but he did seem to have a selector's eye. 
Your read is so good. Chris, who I know better, he's a lovely, he's one of my favorite people to spend time with. If I were having a party where it was really important that someone dance in the middle of the dance floor for eight hours, he would perhaps not make the cut for that party. I think the first question you have to ask yourself, are you a participant or are you a visitor? And it shouldn't sound sophisticated or arrogant. It's just like a club. The, the definition of club is being part of a club. <laughs> and if, you're, if, you're, if you're not part of the club, why should you be able to enter? I think the idea of just buying myself in is the, the opposite of a club, what it should actually be. A club should bring people together who have similar interests, similar preferences. A club should bring together people of similar interests. Absolutely. But what if you're someone who doesn't belong but still wants to just go check it out? Is there a way to sneak in? Is there some other way into Bergheim that is not going through the bouncer? Lutz did have advice about this. My tip that I usually give is make a plan of exploring Berlin, maybe from the outskirts. Go to venues that are not very known. Go to places that are somehow interesting for you because you did your research and you saw some artists that you want to see and yet they're playing. So go there. And you get in very easy because venues that are not very known don't have this kind of level of selection. Usually there's not even the queue. And then you get friends with the bartenders, you, you make friends with the DJs there, and you have an amazing time in an unknown venue with unknown artists, basically. Yeah. And the next time you're coming, you're going to reach out to them. And because they like you or they, they connected to you, they will ask you to start in their home with dinner. Maybe you go to a bar, you make an, make an more friend. And even maybe they make sure that you get in on a guest list of some venue that they're going at that night. But I think it's, it's part of that journey that you also have to make to be part of the scene. So while I agree with him in general, I think I would push back a little bit. I agree with the point that he made in the beginning about the importance of maybe treating clubs like clubs, because that maybe is a reason why the club scene there is so good and why you usually have a good time, even if you go on your own. Most if you go on your own. If you go by yourself, you're probably guaranteed to have a better time than you would any other place in the world. I think so. Especially when it comes to nightclubs. Because people are really just chill and shit. And it's just a fun place where people are expressing themselves, dancing, being free, not being super stuck up and shit. And it's a, a, a quote-unquote democratized dance floor. There's no VIP room. There's no VIP section. All the, Everywhere is kind of accessible to everybody. Blah, 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 blah. Cool. And usually, especially in Berlin, a lot of the clubs are built in this weird, like, maze system. So it's almost like a weird discovery thing to kind of, you know, traverse around it and shit. So all, all great. But I think when it comes to being a participant or being a visitor, I don't think you need to be a participant, in Berlin especially, to get a good idea of what the scene is like. I think it's really important, probably more important, I guess if I was going for the first time again, I would probably go to all the clubs that weren't Bergen. Sorry, Bergen. I always say Bergen. That weren't Bergen. I think that's a better way to get an understanding of this. Like, imagine if you were really new, you didn't really know much, but you wanted to gain an understanding and appreciation of the scene and what it's about. I think going to all the other clubs is way more important than going to Berge Bergen for the most part. It's almost like football in a way. I think if I was teaching somebody about, or if somebody wanted to learn about football culture, I don't think the right place to go is Old Trafford. I think if anything, you should go to like a non-league club, maybe go to a champion club, championship club, maybe even go and watch a Sunday league game. And that would give you a better understanding of British football culture. And then maybe in the end, go to flipping Old Trafford, go and watch a game at the fucking Etihad or something, go and watch a game at fucking Arsenal's ground, Chelsea's ground, Stamford Bridge. That would make more sense. But I think holding up Bergheim as the pedestal and the number one only place to go to is dumb especially considering how you know how hard it is to get in there the demand to get in there as well and I don't think it kind of represents entirety of what this club scene's about you know the club scene is way more nuanced there's way more range there's way more you know there's just way more to see out there than just one club obviously that one club is one almost perfect representation of what clubs should look like but it's not the only one there's plenty of others out there in a city like berlin you're probably doing yourself a disservice by only trying to get into that one place because there's so many which is what makes it 
less painful when they very personally tell you you can't come in because there's tons of clubs that you can go to literally around the corner it's not that deep really if you don't get in but i would advise probably doing that but then when it comes to not being a participant i don't know about you but maybe because i've i've been so i've really enjoyed the last few years where i've kind of taken an active i've made an active decision to not be involved in the scene and to almost approach everything as a fan i enjoy it way more because in the past when i was trying to get in and i was being met by resistance or rude people or pushback i would take it very personally and it would unfortunately affect my ability to enjoy said thing it'll take the enjoyment out of it especially when you know too much you have too much information um you know the inner goings on the back it's just it's hard not to take it personally but i think i enjoy things way more now that i'm a fan than I would be if I'm on the inside. And I think there's nothing wrong with just being a very enthusiastic fan, like I am. Being very enthusiastically into something, following it, but having little to no desire to be involved in the business side and be pally-pally with this person that makes this club and that club. And I think I noticed it a lot with Fold. I think I noticed it a lot with Fold. When I first started going to Fold and talking about Fold a lot on my channel, and I went there a few times, I noticed like a a, a bit of a weird feeling and attitude when I was talking to the back to the owners and something and I almost got like kind of a reminder of how I felt when I you know made a decision to kind of leave the streetwear sneaker scene in London it almost felt like they it, I almost got the impression they got the impression I almost got the impression they felt like I was begging it like I was trying to be their friend when I wasn't I was generally just enthusiastic about a club asking questions and shit and just being you know my normally chatty bubbly self but I guess in their eyes they might have thought like I was trying to get into their club and trying to be in, in the inside and wanting to sit in a green room with them and be friends and get in for free. And it's like, no, if anything, I don't want to ever get in anywhere for free. Maybe somebody puts me on a guest list and wants to support me on their fair to, so I can get in and not have to queue. But I always want to pay my ticket and pay my way, enjoy my night out like everybody else does. And I think there's a real benefit to doing that. It's not all the time you have to ask for things. And I think the old asking of things is always nonsense because, you know, clubs are just clubs. You just pay your ticket, you go in, you have a good time when you go away. And you don't want to be compromised too, you know? You don't want to be compromised and be the type of person that um, can't really give your honest opinion on certain things because somebody put you in a list, because you're friends with this person or that person. It really doesn't make any sense. So I've never really vibed with the idea of being a participant in that way. And even if you do want to be a participant, I think you're better off creating your own thing than trying to get in with the cruel kids, personally. I think creating your own thing, having your own club night, having your own label, having your own channel, having your own page, pushing your own people or push people that you are into and stuff or having your own voice is probably a far better way to get involved than trying to beg it with clubs and try and be that guy that's always trying to get on guesses because we all know them right every country every city in the world has those people who are always trying to get in on the guest list always trying to social climb it's gross i don't like it i don't think anybody does like it maybe the people that are getting sucked off probably like it but i personally don't and would never do it so i do prefer doing it my way where you just go and enjoy things like a like a very enthusiastic customer like a very and i see a lot of them you go out to clubs and places and you see people like myself who maybe are way more geeky and into it than i am who will follow a certain person like you know the renee wears fine club is a good example i've met a ton of people who are massive renee wise um fans who basically follow him all around europe wherever he plays um they then meet other people who follow him as well and that's all well and good because i don't think he gets those people into in for free I don't think he even meets these people after to kind of have a drink. They're just fans of his. They like to see him play. They go to different cities to go and see it. And then through that, they meet other people. It's not really that deep, to be fair. And if you do want to get involved, just make your own rave. Make your own thing. There's plenty of room out here to do your own thing. And everybody's gagging for a new thing anyway. And maybe your point of view and the way you do things might be interesting for a lot of people to kind of check out and see. So the whole idea about being a participant to get involved is dumb. And if anything, personally as well, this is a really weird point to make, but I personally would much rather much rather not get into a place like Bergheim because I just did, didn't get chosen than kind of cheat and get on the guest list yes the guest list doesn't guarantee entry as famously we all know um, Elon Musk allegedly when he got denied from Bergheim he actually had a guest list 
That's what people don't know. He actually was on the guest list allegedly. Allegedly, that time, I think it was around the time um, the Tesla Berlin factory was about to be opened. He was traveling a lot to Berlin and he went to Bergheim to try and go and rave and he got turned away. And people don't realize that he actually was on the guest list and still got denied at the door. So guest list obviously isn't a guaranteed entry, but it does increase your chances as long as you're not a fucking idiot. But I would, per I would personally, personally prefer to not get into a place like Ber Bergheim and just, you know, have that be an L and that's a far better story than cheat your way in by getting on the guest list, have to send someone DMs, have to beg and plead, you know, get left on scene, follow somebody around, all that really lame, G-A-Y, horrendous, cringy shit. I would never want to do that, ever. I'd much rather just, you know, for lack of a better term, take a ruler to my wrist and bleed out didn't have to do that sort of thing and it really isn't that deep it's one of the best cities in the world for clubbing anyway just go and ch open your map and go check out some other places and go and enjoy yourself over there there's no need to fucking beg and plead for a nightclub and again it's only a nightclub yes it's great yes it's a fun time yes it's probably the best club experience you're ever gonna have but it isn't really that deep it isn't really that deep but i recommend you check out that podcast it's fucking amazing freakonomics really really good and i think the second part is on his podcast called um uh, I forgot, you'll, you'll find it. I'll put a link in the description. But essentially the second part, um, he speaks about his experience. He doesn't actually speak about it, PJ Vault actually. He does that whole thing of like trying to respect the space. I'm not going to speak. Say it, bro. I'm not sure why people, maybe it's a, it's a hindrance, it's a folly of the generation we're in now. Some people can't talk about their own experience without describing other people. But I understand the idea of like, you know, it's a secretive place. People cover your cameras. You know, don't recall people. Don't talk about what people get up to because it's a place where people do what they want to do and be free and shit. But you can talk about your own experience without mentioning what other people did. It shouldn't be that difficult. But I guess maybe it is. Maybe people do find it actually difficult um, to talk about an experience that they had without mentioning what other people were doing. It's easy. I've done it plenty of times on here. I've not mentioned a single person. I've I've seen a bunch of famous people in there getting up to all sorts of nonsense. I've never mentioned it once. And it's easy to do so, but some people can't. I guess it is what it is. But I recommend you check it out. Really fun episode. Um, I enjoyed hearing him speak about it. And I think it's nice as well coming from a journalist who isn't really plugged into the scene. He's approaching it, you know, in a journalistic way, investigating, asking questions, sometimes cringy, lame questions. Oh, look at that guy's haircut. Jesus Christ, bro. What the hell is that? Look at that haircut. Those type of haircuts that you can't ever get as a black person, isn't it? That's kind of like an Andrew Schultz haircut. Those are the type of haircuts you can't get as a black person because we like fades and we like looking too prim and proper. We could never get a bowl cut like that where they push the hairline back all the way like that and just left his hair on the top. He almost looks like a pen, like a rubber on the end of a pencil. That's the kind of a haircut he's got. You could never, ever do that if you're a black or Hispanic. It's never going to happen. People are going to look at you like, what? Why isn't your hair faded? But when you're white, you can get away with those trims. So big up him anyway. Big up him. But anyway, check out the episode. It's really cool. I enjoyed it. And it kind of gave me more enthusiasm and encouragement to go back to Bergheim soon. And get my sticker on my phone. Anyway, cool. Um, let's leave it there because I have to prep for the random show. So thank you for tuning in, people. I appreciate everybody that's tuned in to the podcast. I appreciate you all. Make sure you smash um, the like button if you're watching this video after the fact on YouTube when I re-upload. Make sure you hit the fucking five-star reviews on all the podcast apps that you listen to. That'd be greatly appreciated. Give me a fucking like. Don't be stingy. Give me a bloody like. That would be absolutely incredible. I'd love to flip and see that. Um, and then, of course,